All right, so let's get started. Sorry for the delay. Like I sent out the announcement, um, I ended up uh, posting all the scores for the midterm. Um, those online, if you can put something in the chat so that you can confirm that you're hearing me. Um, I think I saw a transcript, so I think the audio is going through. But, um, but I took a little extra time before this uh, to get those individual level stats out. Um, I wanted to get the question level stats out as well, so we kind of see how well everybody did. Um, like um, I mentioned, the um, almost uh, everyone did better, in some cases significantly better, on their stage two. Uh, but um, and so the the averages are a lot higher. Um, there were still a couple of problems that posed a little bit of difficulty. The toilet tank one was kind of the hardest problem. So I put kind of an explanation for why the answer to that was escalation. And, um, and also you can see the solution set that I posted there. So all that is, uh, is linked. Um, and notice we have a lot less, fewer people in class today as well as um, online. And I hope that is due to spring break and not due to the midterm. So, um, uh, and uh, for those of you who are here, appreciate uh, um, you hanging around when I'm sure you could be elsewhere. Um, for those who are watching this asynchronously, totally fine uh, too. Um, just make sure to hit that as attendance questions um, and or just take one of your five drops. Um, okay, so we're moving on to a new section here. Um, any questions or uh, lingering concerns about the midterm? Everybody should see their scores out there. Yeah. Uh, well, so um, I'd have to do a detailed, uh, I'd have to do a, a more detailed analysis than I got to be able to answer if there was one question everyone got wrong, or if, um, like, no one got a 36 out of 36, but I can't, uh, but I don't know if, um, if there was one question that everyone got wrong, you know what I mean? So it's still possible for, um, but I can tell you that um, in and looking down through very quickly before class, that escalation problem, if there was one that nobody got right, um, I would say it's probably the escalation one, but I have to confirm that. There were people who got it right on stage one, um, but then, um, then you know, it appear they like the, definitely the, the, the percentage bar for correctness on that one seemed to have gone uh, significantly down. So, um, so it's one of those things where in that case, I think the, the social, um, information might have dominated the private information and maybe swayed people this and there. So um, in listening to the conversations during the stage two, while I was sitting up here, it seemed like there was some confusion as to whether, and for in some groups, whether the leak was a positive feedback or a negative feedback. And then those who recognize it was a negative feedback, there seemed to be confusion between drifting goals and uh, maybe escalation. And I think that um, for whatever reason, uh, drifting goals, it, it, you could actually, view that as a as a um, success to the successful sort of archetype for whatever reason drifting goals i think um took off and then beat out uh, escalation but if you look back actually in some of our the previous lectures i find it i did an example with a bucket where uh, water was filling it up and i even extended the bucket where i had a leak to the bucket and i said that was escalation that's exactly the toilet problem so we have that example back in the notes if you want to sort of review that and like i said in the announcements i kind of tried to explain it so yeah are you going to open it up so that we can individually see what we got wrong oh yes i'm sorry I, again i was just rushing trying to get it all done but absolutely i will um after this class i'll go through and check that box right. mm -hmm. any other questions anything online okay great all right so before the midterm we kind of learned how to basically get basic stock and flow models going after the midterm, we're now going to use that to mail build more complex models and analyze those models and then link them to problems that might be more kind of related to sustainability. So um, in order to get there um, in this kind of first unit of that, I want to introduce uh, units, sliders, and lookup tables today. These are things that exist in pretty much any stock and flow, any system dynamics modeling tool you can find, including BinSim and Insight Maker. So First thing I'm gonna talk about is units. So, so far when we've put in formulas, uh, we haven't specified units anywhere. But if you actually, you can tell Vinsim and Insight Maker that this formula should have these units. And if it knows the units of all the other variables in your model, then it can do a sanity check for you and say, 
there must be something wrong with your formula because I expected this to be centimeters per second and I'm getting centimeter seconds or I'm getting seconds per centimeter and that doesn't match what I'm expecting. And so that helps you flag when, oh, maybe I entered a formula in wrong or maybe my logic wasn't right when I built that formula. So that's why we like to put in uh, units inside here. It sort of helps us uh, do these sanity checks and do the dimensional analysis for us. So how do we do that? Well, we've seen this a little bit already. So if you go into the settings in VinSim, and I can also bring up VinSim and show these sorts of things, but we've seen that you can choose units for time. So that's one place you can do this. And that basically, um, the key thing there is when you're doing your plots, that changes the units in the sort of the plotting down at the bottom. Uh, but there's more. So if you actually go into the formulas for any the auxiliary variables, the flows, or the stocks, then up here at the top, there's this thing called units, which by default is blank. And there's a check units button over here. And so the idea here is that inside VinSim, um, you can click that, that down uh, uh, box there to just pull down that drop down, And you'll find that there's a couple of units that are already provided. There's this funny unit DMNL, which just means dimensionless, which basically is another way of saying no units. And then there's whatever the time unit you were using in, in um, the settings were. So second may show up there. But you can then add in your own custom units and you can create ratios of units that it knows are ratios of units so that it can properly convert from one to the other when you're doing multiplication. So I can actually manually type in there meters per second. I have to use the slash, I can't write per. Um, Insight Maker is smart enough to know the word per but VinSim, you got to use the slash. So I can put in meters per second or just meters, germs per month. Um, and uh, so I can create my own units or I can create ratios of units just by manually typing them in up here. And so then after I do that, after I tell it what units I'm expecting, if I've gone in and typed a formula down here, so this is a stock, so I wouldn't type a formula in here, but if this was a, um, a flow or an auxiliary, I would actually type a formula in here. I can hit that check units button and it will then evaluate the formula that I have here based on the units it knows about in those variables. And it will see, do the units match what I was expecting? And if there's an error, it'll put um, an error down here that says incorrect units, and then you can go and fix that. So that's how we can do these units. Now, yeah. Um, does Vincent pair, like do we have to spell out the entire word or can we do the uh, like abbreviation? That's a good question. I think this will answer that. Okay. So, um, so VinSim isn't smart enough to automatically like create plurals and things like that, but VinSim lets you specify synonyms. And so you can go into model and settings, and then there's these tabs that we haven't used before. So normally we just use this time bounds tab. If we go over, there's a units equiv tab, and it has a bunch of default equivalences. And notice in this list, these are just other things you can use that Vincent knows are just synonyms. And so if I use a dollar sign, I mean, yours, they might have changed the defaults here. So you have to go with whatever's in here. But at, when I uh, built this, took this screenshot, these were the defaults. And so um, like if I use a dollar sign, notice at the top here, it says dollar, comma, at a dollar sign, comma, dollar, comma, dollars, comma, dollar sign X. So it's saying that across my model, Whenever I use any one of those four, it will consider them to be the same unit. So I might say, I don't like typing dollar, but I also don't like the dollar sign. I could create an abbreviation called like DL or USD or something like that. And I can go in to this line, I could click on that guy, and then I could go and say modify selected. It would pull it down here, and then I could add comma USD or something like that. And then I can do that for all these years. And then I can add ones too. Like it doesn't have a unit for germ. Well, I can put both the singular and the plural down here, germ and germs. And then throughout the rest of my model, I could either use the singular or the plural. It won't matter. It'll know those are the same. So that's how we do unit equivalences. And we can also do this in Insight Maker. So, which I'll show you. So any questions about that so far? Okay. 
And by the way, this stuff that we're doing here with units and all that, there is a, an assignment coming up. I think it's assignment E4 or something, which technically means it's released, you know, at the end of the unit, at the, at, you know, at a, or maybe it's E3, but it's already available. And the first question you'll be able to do using stuff that we talk about today. So if you want to get started on that, and it's basically, here's a basic system, um, add units to the system and get it working, that sort of thing. So that's why this is all kind of relevant to that. Now, after you've gone through and done all your units, if you didn't want to go through and hit that check units button on every single formula, you could do your whole model, and then you can go to the model menu and then say units check. And if you do that, it will then wash over your whole model and make sure that all of your units check throughout all the modules. And if they don't, it'll tell you where there's a problem. And then that will then highlight a formula that you might need to go in and fix. So it's a good way to do a little sanity check. All right. So those are units in Vincent. So any questions about that before we see how it works in Insight Maker? Insight Maker's units um, are a little bit more full feature than Vincent. They preload a lot more units and they allow for sort of even more flexibility, um, but it's the same basic idea. So in Insight Maker, we have that settings menu at the top. And you know, so it's got the time unit. So again, you choose your time unit as in Vincent. Um, but more exciting is when you go to edit a formula for, um, for either a flow or a variable, converter a variable, um, then inside the expression here, and also I think this works also for the stock for the initial conditions, down in the bottom left, there is a units here. And by default, it's unitless. But if you click on that, it brings up this units menu here where it's got a bunch of units already grouped in categories. So it tells me what units I've already used in the model because I might need access to those. It also tells me like it groups the units by distance, velocity, mass, et cetera. So it's got a bunch of units like standard SI units and so on that are already in there and a bunch of synonyms already built for them. So it, you can probably find the unit you want, but you still can go up and type in whatever unit you'd like up here. And you can actually use the per uh, word as well. And it knows that per is like sets up a ratio. So, um, so I think you can use actually both an insight maker, the slash or the per, um, and uh, so you can create your own units. And then those will show up here, up here, as well as in the units used in the model. So same sort of thing in Vinsim, you can add your own units in for every formula. And this is just saying, you can also type it in, like I was saying before, and then there's a unit conversions button, which is just kind of the synonyms button, but it does even more than the synonyms in uh, Vinsim because in Insight Maker, you can actually say that units are related by a formula. So, um, so in Vinsim, you can only do synonyms. I can say uh, a dollar sign and a dollar, word dollar and dollar sign are the same thing. Here, I can actually say, for example, if I go to unit conversions, um, I can say that, um, that there is like a foreign germ is the same as 15 of a germ. So, um, and I can say that a plural foreign germs is one of foreign germs. So if I set the scale equal to one, I build synonyms. So I can build plural synonyms or whatever, but I can set the scale to something else and that allows me to relate things together. So, um, and I can relate units that are like, I could say, it's a, a little bit weird to say that like a germ is equal to one second, but I could do that if for some reason I wanted to equate these two things. So I can make these synonyms that aren't just plurals, um, but you could also say like um, uh, if there's a prefix you're using, um, like a kilogram, I could say a kilogram is a thousand grams. Now those conversions, it's already, you know, kilograms already under uh, mass and things like that. But if you want to have scale, um, you can say, you know, or, uh, you know, how many, how many Gauss are in a Tesla? You know, those are two units of magnetism. So if you have two units, like, you know, converting from imperial units to SI units, um, you know, those gonna have those conversions units there. So you can set up all those conversion ratios by using the scale. So it's like, it's like synonyms plus. So it's not just synonyms. By default, it defaults to one. So you can think of this as just a synonyms table but it has this extra feature we can up the scale. So does that make sense? Questions on this basic idea? Questions online? 
Okay. Now, um, other when you're specifying units, so you specify the unit that comes out of the formula down here. <clears throat> now, when you're actually typing in literal numbers up here, for whatever reason, like let's say you looked it up on Google and this, this particular uh, expression from the data you have was expressed in centimeters per second, but you want all the rest of your stuff to be in meters per second throughout the model. Well, um, Insight Maker allows you to use curly braces around these literal units. So I can specify up here that this is in one centimeter per second, and it knows how to convert centimeters to meters. And because it knows that what comes out of this box is meters per second, it will automatically do that conversion for me. So in VinSim, if I looked up a, a, a parameter that I want to put in my model to make my model more realistic, I might have to convert from centimeters to meters in my head, which is easy enough to do, but it's also, you know, nine times out of 10, you do it right, but one times out of 10, you move the decimal the wrong place or not enough places or whatever. This does that for you. So you can just put in whatever unit you're most comfortable in reading at it, and it will automatically convert it coming out. So that's kind of a cool feature. Okay, so that makes sense. This idea you can put literals and curly braces and it'll do the conversion for you. So you actually type in the unit and you put curly braces around it. Questions on that? Okay. All right, so then how do you do the units check? Well, by default, whenever you hit simulate, it automatically goes through. It will not allow you to run your model unless your units check up. So if you put units in here, you hit simulate, and it'll say, uh, oh, it'll say, um, oh, well, this this stock has got a unit in consistency. So I guess I could, um, I think I could show that. Um, so if I were to bring up, because I was late, I kind of wanted to save on some of the demos here, but maybe I'll just do a demo in Insight Maker, just to give an example of what that looks like. So I will drag my insight maker over. Here, I think, yes. So I've gone into insight maker and it's a, gonna clear this out here. I think everybody in class and online can see this. So if I go in and I say, add a stock, that I'll, um, I'll call this, I don't know. Um, well, I'm gonna say under the units for this stock, I'll do a simple bacteria example. And so I'm gonna call this unit uh, germ or germs. So that's a unit that I've created here. And I'll say that it starts out with a hundred. So my initial condition for this stock. And I'm going to change the name of this stock to bacteria. And then I will create an outflow by going to the middle of this thing, dragging this and pulling it out. I'll call that deaths. I'm going to draw a link to make deaths depend. on bacteria, hold down shift, click there, grab the handle, pull it up to make the link more obvious. And then I might create a variable called um, maybe death rate per bacteria. Find my mouse again. There it is. Okay. I'll just draw that over here. I'm going to link that to deaths as well. And then I go inside my death rate per bacteria. And I need to come up with units for this one. My mouse isn't showing on the Zoom display. And so I know that this death rate bacteria per bacteria, um, so this is just an example I kind of came up with off the cuff here. So I know that I will have um, that 
this is gonna be multiplied per bacteria. So I'm gonna say this is like in units of one per second. So the idea here is I want it to be, ultimately when I multiply this by the number of bacteria, I want that unit to be bacteria per second. So this one per second is like there's one death per second per bacteria. So I'm just gonna write this as, as one per second. I think it'll allow me to do that. Go ahead, apply. I'll hit apply there. And then if I go down to my deaths flow and hit equal, try, then here it shows me I can use bacteria and death rate bacteria. I'm gonna to need to update these units. So I'll go and turn off this restrict. This is good practice. I'm gonna do bacteria times death rate per bacteria. And my expected units are going to be of germs per second. But just to show what's gonna happen, I'm gonna leave it as unitless right now um, so that we can see what the error is gonna be like. So I'm just gonna leave it as that. And if I were to click simulate, then it pops up this nice error up here, wrong units generated for deaths, expected one over years, got germs per second. Now notice it's kind of an interesting thing, one over years, where'd years come from? I never went into model settings, and so it used the default time setting, which is years, but it knows how to convert years and seconds. And so that's the reason why, even though I did one per second, internally it represented it as one per years with conversion factors. So when I process these errors, sometimes I have to think to myself, well, what do you mean years? I didn't write years. And really what it's saying, got one over time, expected germs per time. So, um, so that, that tells me that my formula um, here is probably wrong, or the units coming out of, of, say, death rate per bacteria might be wrong. I know it's my units here are wrong. So I am going to say, okay, what I actually meant to do was say that this flow was in germs per second. Now, let me show you one other thing before I, I show you that that'll work. If I were to go into my bacteria stock where I set the initial condition, I said that it was its units were germs. Now, if I were to set this to unit lists because I forgot to set it to, you know, left it at its default, if I try to simulate this thing, it should also complain. And it complains because, um, because remember, a outflow is always the units of the stock per unit time. Well, in this case, the units of the stock were unitless. And that's why it's one per second. But um, I wrote the outflow as germs per second. So it got germs per second and it was expecting one per second. This is an example where this formula and that unit is correct. The flow is correct, but it's the stock. I didn't put the right units in. So then that tells me I need to go over and edit the stock. And so let me go and change the units on the stock. And I'm gonna change this to just germs. And now if I simulate, it's totally happy. And, um, you know, and I guess I never set the death rate per bacteria. That's why they're not dying. So I guess I will go ahead and just for completeness, set the death rate to one. And, um, and then I'll go up to my settings and adjust my DT. Maybe I'll make it 0 0.1 or maybe 0 0.01. Maybe I'll change the base units to seconds and run it for 20, that's fine. So now if I simulate, it has no errors and it's going to simulate this thing and it, and it for dramatic reasons, it plots it at a decreased speed. And so now what we're seeing here is the number of bacteria as well as the outflow plotted together. And if I look closely, I can see that it's put time here in seconds 
and, um, and it lists bacteria and bacteria death rate. If I add a legend, I think it'll actually show me the units for those. So I'm gonna go here under configure and under legend position, I'm going to change it to below or above. Maybe I'll do top. I could have done automatic, I suppose. Oh, right, and if I wanted to add the units, there are ways I can adjust the label. So um, down here, like on this, this is kind of more advanced, but um, if I do something like um, on the Y axis, the percent O means whatever the output name is, and then percent U is whatever the unit is. So again, this is a little more advanced, but if I did want to generate these graphs on my own, then um, I can actually have it plot the units. And I on this, so you can kind of see it just barely. Um, oh, I, so I, I'd have to look up what the right percentage sign is there. So I got that wrong. So I think um, if I went into the help files, I can find it's not percent U, it's like percent uppercase U or something. I would have to play with that, but there are ways that you can, um, that's not percent, I'd have to look it up. And so um, I wasn't kind of prepared to do this ahead of time, but in the, in the help, you can actually find out that there's a code here where it'll print the unit corresponding to whatever you're plotting right next to it. And, um, and so, uh, in, and I just forget whether that's, there is a letter for that, but I'm gonna forget about that for the moment and just leave it at the percent O. But the point here is that the units allowed me to do the simulation, which tells me that all my formulas are at least the right structure that the units check out. So it's a sanity check that maybe I did the right thing. And this is the output I expected, um, where, by the way, this is the time constant you can see. So I said like, I forget what I said the death rate uh, was. I might've said one or something like that. And so if I look at one, that's where, so it's, it's now around, you know, I said 63.21%. Well, you know, one minus 63.21% is roughly 37%. And so not surprisingly, if I go up to 37%, there's my one. So that's where that time constant comes out, just as a bonus for this example. All right, so that's um, how you do units in Insight Maker. So any questions about that? Does anybody need a similar demo done in VinSim or does that kind of feel pretty explained? It's very similar in VinSim where the check units will throw up the same sort of errors and you have to go and make the same sort of change. Okay. Um, there we go. All right, so no questions. Okay, so um, for sliders, so this is the next thing we're gonna do here. Um, so units is great, but then sliders allow us to kind of more rapidly prototype different settings here. I have a video posted on Canvas for a more detailed tutorial, but I just wanna give you a brief overview of how sliders work. So in VinSim, you can draw a diagram inside VinSim, and there's a bunch of constants. So wherever your constants are, so as an example, in this one here, this inflow doesn't have any links coming to it. So that means that this inflow uh, is just going to be a constant number inside there. Whereas this outflow has got a link coming into it, which tells me that there's a formula inside here that makes use of this variable that's down here. Anything that's a constant, in other words, doesn't have any incoming links. If I go up and instead of hitting run up here, I click the button next to run. It's called synth the sim. So there's next to it, there's simulate, which generates data, and then synth the sim or synth sim next to it. Um, when I do that, what it does is it adds a little slider underneath every constant. And then as you adjust the slider, it automatically updates uh, the, um, these little thumbnail images that are on top of each one of the dynamic variables. So it, it, it simulates them every time you drag that slider around. So um, I can bring that up. Maybe that's a good example to do in VinSim. All right, I'm just gonna save this temporarily here. move this over so we can all see it. Maybe I'll increase the font size. 
so we can all see it. All right, so if I do a simple example here, I'm not gonna use units for this one. I'm just gonna draw a, a, a box variable. I'll call it bacteria. Where did my Vincent go? Right there. I'm gonna try to drag that to make it bigger. I'll go up, I'll hit the rate button which in the new version um, it might just look like that little arrow. So I can click on this guy and then click out here. I'll type in deaths, draw my links. So go up the arrow, draw a link from bacteria to deaths, grab the little handle, attempt to grab the little handle. I may not be able to do that without pulling this over. There we go. All right, so I got my very simple bacterial model here. Now, the idea here is I would like to, I'm gonna just put a hard code, I'll go to the formulas here. And under bacteria, I will bring up a formula and I'll just say, I wanna start with 100 bacteria. So initial value 100. Remember in stocks, you never adjust the formulas. You only adjust the, um, adjust the uh, initial values. If I wanted to, I could play with the units just like I did in Insight Maker, but for time, I'm not gonna worry about that. And then under deaths, um, I will start out with a constant. I will say that I want, um, I guess I'm gonna need another parameter. So let me add uh, a auxiliary variable. So I'm gonna go up and hit A for auxiliary variable. I'll type in death rate per bacteria, draw a link into the deaths, exactly like we just did in Insight Maker. Then I edit the formulas. And so deaths is just a simple formula, bacteria times death rate per bacteria. Pull that up here, bacteria, death rate bacteria times, bacteria, it doesn't matter the order I do them in. And then um, I am going to click on death rate per bacteria and I can put in a starter death rate of say one. And then I'll go up and adjust my model settings. So, um, so over here, I'll go to model settings. And I'm gonna adjust my DT to be pretty small so that I can experiment with a lot of rates. I might change this unit for time just so it's not month. And then my DT here, I'll make 0 0.01. And my final time, maybe I'll just make five. All right, so now instead of hitting sim, simulate, I'm gonna do synth to sim. And what it does is it draws a little slider under the one constant that I have. And that's this death rate per bacteria. And it might be hard to see, but it has a little one on it right now. And if I click on that and drag it back and forth, then I don't know if you can tell, it, I increased it closer to five now in, the, in this little thumbnail image inside the bacteria stock. That thumbnail image there, I'll just highlight it here, um, it has a little blue line down here. And if I hold my mouse over it, like I'm doing here, um, it actually then brings it out and shows you a, a, a other version of it. And if I drag that back and forth, you can see that that line is getting steeper and shallower depending on what the bed, the death rate set to. So there I dragged it and now this little thing is a lot shallower. So the idea here is if I have a bunch of parameters and I'm like looking for a sweet spot, then I can put, I can have all of these constant out here, hit synth to sim, and then I can drag the sliders, uh, move them around. And then sort of in real time, I can then quickly see how the shapes of these curves are changing. This is not that exciting for the bacterial one because it's just changing how steep this is. But 
in some examples that you're going to do um, with fisheries, there's like a critical number of boats that might, you know, if you go above that number of boats, the fishery collapse. Below that number of boats, the fishery is fine. Well, you can have a slider for the number of boats and you can slide it around and find the point where the fishery collapses. And so you can have a little fish population stock that starts at some initial value and then goes down to its, its steady state value with the boats. And it's gonna be steady, steady, steady until you get to a critical number of boats and then it's gonna to go to extinction. And, um, and that point where it flips might be a critical point for you to know the top number of boats that I can have in this fishery. And this is something you can rapidly get by sliding that thing around and looking for that point. So this is an example of what you can do with this synthesis. All right, questions on that? And then once I get a parameter there, um, it's saved that data set. So I can then, um, I could go up to synthesim. So I have to stop synthesim when I'm done with it. And then if I were to go over in graph, so I'll go to bacteria, I click on graph, and then I can get my standard graph and I can export those graphs and so on. So, um, so the parameters that are left off after synthesim unless I'm remembering this incorrectly or they've changed it, um, get saved here. Otherwise, you can always record the parameters you have down and then put them back in um, to your model and then you can generate those. So it's a way to play around with that. All right, so any questions on that? Questions online? Okay, let me see questions in meeting pulse. I don't see any. All right, so that is synthesim. Uh, there's a tutorial on Canvas where I show you how to make larger sliders and larger plots. Right now, um, it, it's kind of a drag to look at the preview of the plots inside of here. Well, I show you on Canvas, if you're interested, how to draw a big plot that's fixed to your Canvas so that um, you can kind of always see a blown up view of this. And then as you're moving synthesim, it'll update that plot. So that's on Canvas for those of you who are interested. All right, now you can do the same sort of thing in Insight Maker. Um, for time, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but it's a basically the same idea. I can draw a simple diagram in Insight Maker. I can draw variables. One of those variables is a constant. So if I click on that constant, it brings up this, uh, this slider, this drawer on the right-hand side. And up at the very top, you can adjust the name, um, you can also then adjust the value and so on. And then underneath here, it has a slider section. And under the slider section, you can say show value slider, yes. And you can say, I want my slider minimum to be zero, uh, max to be 100. And then you can set your slider step. So you can actually set forced gradations on your slider so that if like you want it to always be an integer, it'll be zero, one, two, or whatever. You can't ever have a 0 0.5 or a 1.5. So you can force that, that's what the slider step is sort of a, a, um, a minimum distance between slider levels you can do right there. After you do that, it's not quite as nice as synthesim or synthesim and vinsim. But if you click away from the variable, all of the sliders that you've turned on will show up in that drawer. And they allow you to quickly change them by moving this back and forth. Now, it doesn't automatically update a graph. But the idea is that after you change them, you can hit simulate and it'll pop up an output. And then you can hit change them, hit simulate, and it'll pop up another output, and then you can directly compare them. So it's not a real time change, but it is a way to rapidly change those variables and generate graph over graph over graph. So you adjust the sliders, hit simulate, pops up a new graph, you can leave that. And then when you run simulate again, it doesn't get rid of your old graph, it generates a new graph. And so you got a bunch of windows of graphs that you can compare for different slider levels. So not quite as nice as synthesim, uh, but a very similar idea. Okay. All right, so any questions about that, using sliders in Vinsim and Insight Maker? Just a way to make it more practical to use these tools. And like I said, there'll be in a question, I think actually maybe on that um, same homework assignment, the second part of the homework assignment, where I ask you to use sliders to find that critical number of boats that causes the fishery to tip into collapse. Questions online? 
All right, great. All right, I will get to an attendance exercise to make sure everybody who's taken the time to come here, which I really appreciate, um, gets credit for that. But again, I want to uh, make sure that I don't uh, use too much time so we can get through everything here. All right, so I think the last big thing that I wanna to cover today is lookup table converters. So we've seen lookup tables before. Now we actually get to see how to implement them. So lookup tables capture relationships without ever having to specify a mathematical formula. So they're called lookup tables because um, I might wanna have an input like number of bacteria and an output like the death rate to the population. And I wanna go from number of bacteria to the death rate of the population, but I don't have a mathematical expression that allows me to, to figure out for every death rate what the bacteria uh, is. But I might have data that shows that as um, the number of bacteria in an experiment goes up, the number of bacteria dying per unit time has a certain relationship. And maybe somebody's already drawn that out as a graph. They just don't know a mathematical expression for that graph. So what this allows us to do is to start it up and put it in something called a lookup table, which basically says we're going to draw the graph in InsightMaker or VinSim, and we're going to use the graph to look up the right death rate. So the x-axis of the graph will be the input, and then the graph itself is a mapping that says for every input, what output are we going to look at? And I'll show you that here in a second. In InsightMaker, this is a little confusing. They're called converters. Um, I know so far in the Moorcroft text and in VinSim, we've been calling any auxiliary variable a converter. And I'm okay with that. But in InsightMaker, they specifically call lookup tables converters and everything else variables. So that's just kind of a difference in the language. Now, we saw an example of this already for the simple fish population from chapter one of Moorcroft. So it's got this simple feedback loop. Uh, where you've got fish stock, calculates fish density, and then from the fish density, calculates a regeneration rate going back to fish stock. And this was the lookup table here. Now, what do we mean by lookup table? Um, this is a graph that's got, you know, imagine empirically someone's gone out and they know that when there's a certain fish density, you get a certain net regeneration rate. They've taken this from data in a real system. So we can encode this curve as a set of corners, a set of points. And so this whole curve, we kind of say is um, whatever happens at zero, zero, whatever happens at whatever this point is, that point is, and so on, and then draw a straight line between them, but interpolate between them. And so that lookup table is these set of corners, and then it just draws a straight line in between them. What does it do with that? For whenever, the model simulates a particular fish density like this blue density down here it then uses that on the x-axis and it goes up and wherever it hits this line it then produces that net regeneration rate so a different fish density different net regeneration rate so it's a way to convert from fish density to net regeneration rate without ever having to specify a mathematical formula that's why they're called converters in insight maker so we can do this, so we've got a couple of different ones here. Now, um, in, um, in Stella, for example, then these are specified as a list of these corner points. And you can see in actually most of these, there's a specified as a list of these corner points. So in Moorcroft, where he uses Stella, um, when we actually look in chapter one the, about the formulas corresponding to this model, then we can look down and for this net regeneration, instead of specifying a mathematical formula, it uses this thing says graph fish density. All that's saying is that the fish density um, is taken as an input and the output will be determined by a graph. And that graph is specified as these corner points. So these points down here, zero, zero, that's this point up here, zero, zero, 0 0.150, that's this point here, 0 0.150. 0.2, 100, that's this point up here, and so on. So all the way down to one zero, which is this point over here, one zero. So by specifying all these corners and then it interpolates here, we end up getting a graphical relationship between fish density, the input, and net regeneration, the output. That's the basic idea behind these. So before I show how we draw, how we implement these in Vincent and an insight maker, are there any general questions about this idea of using a lookup table or a graph instead of a mathematical expression to map from one variable to another? That makes sense. 
It's what lives inside this thing. And in Stella, they put a little like kind of a, it's kind of a squiggle at the bottom of the auxiliary variable to tell you that there is a lookup table inside there. And then they show you a preview, a tiny little thumbnail preview of what that lookup table looks like right inside of the variable. That's how we tell that there's a lookup table and not a mathematical formula there. Okay, questions online? All right, let's see how to implement those in VinSim then. So lookup tables in VinSim, um, I drew the exact same system that was in chapter one. So we got the new, new fish per year, the fish stock, et cetera. And I got this net regeneration lookup table right here. So, um, so I go into this net regeneration. So I'm gonna hit equations to go into net regeneration. And that's going to bring up the, the big formula here. And usually um, the default here is this would be auxiliary. And then under here, I think the subtype is normally blank. Well, what I do is I change the subtype from being blank or equation or whatever it normally is, and I change it to with lookup. And so notice auxiliary, it keeps the same, but under here, subtype with lookup. And that tells me, that tells Vincent that I'm not gonna put a formula in, I'm gonna put a graph in instead. So then how do I specify that graph? Well, um, well so yeah, I'll get to that in a second. So in the, equation part here, I just put whatever the input to the graph is going to be. So in this case, I've linked fish density up to it. So I'm just going to put fish density there. In theory, you could actually put a formula here and it would use the formula as an input. But for simplicity, we usually just put a single input there to keep it simple. Then I can click on the as graph and it pops up a new dialog where I put that list of points in. And this is the same list of points that I just read uh, right off of uh, more crops here. So I've got zero, zero, that's this point here, point two, 100, that's this point, point three, 200, that's this point, all the way down to one zero, that's this point here. And then it automatically will graph that for me. I can specify down here, oh, let me, sorry, I mean, thought I did more here, that the minimum value of, of the input is zero, the maximum value of the input is one, and sets that here. And then it's actually, um, um, then I can also change the maximum Y value displayed and the minimum Y value displayed here to change how this graph looks. But then that looks just like the graph that Moorcroft has. So then when I then click okay down here and then notice, so again, you'll have an experience of this in the homework. I just type these numbers in. I can either type them in or I can actually click on the graph and then I can drag these points around. That's another way to do it. So I can go down here and I can type new and put a new point in. It'll automatically put these up here. I can go to an existing point and edit the points, or I can click on points and I can add points. And then I can also delete points as well. So, um, so there's, this is kind of a user interface that allows you to add and delete points. When I click okay, I go back and then I see something just like I saw in Stella, a list of points. So down here under the lookup here, I can drill down into this and I see that it's the first uh, couple of numbers are the bottom left and the top right corner of the lookup table. It just kind of sets the, how the size of the axes. And then next to it are my list of points that I specified. So the same points here, um, it looks like when I did this, I skipped 0.150. Um, so when I was reading this through, I guess I just forgot that one. So I jumped over that. But otherwise, all of the points here that are showing up here show up down here. Now, if you get as an expert at this, you can actually manually type this in if you want. But most people just use the as graph to implement it graphically instead. All right. So after I do that, I can simulate. And it acts just like it would with a mathematical formula. Here's the, um, the example from Moorcroft. Here's the example from VinSim. There's my fish stock. There's my regeneration rate. They look exactly the same, except for maybe some axis scaling. So that's how I do lookup tables in VinSim. So any questions about that? Okay. Questions online? So you will have to implement um, a lookup table in this homework assignment coming up as well. Really powerful. All right, so um, 
I'm going to skip over this uh, section of slides here. Um, you may have noticed that um, under type or when you start working in this, there is a, this is the, the box in the equations that normally says auxiliary. If you click on that one instead of subtype, you may notice that there is a lookup type. And there is another way to do lookup tables in VinSim that I go over in the next couple of slides here. That you're welcome to take a look at offline. Um, I only put them here so that you know why VinSim has this additional type lookup. But it's, an, it's a more advanced way to use lookup tables that we don't need. So I'm going to skip over that um, and go a couple of slides ahead here. But it's, it, it, this is an equivalent way of doing it. It's just sort of a different style. So I'm just going to jump over uh, these slides here. And, but the point is, um, make sure when you do it to change this to auxiliary and, um, and with lookup instead of lookup here. So it's going to be tempting to put lookup into this type, but instead, uh, you know, do it the way I did it in the previous one. Auxiliary with lookup, not lookup. So, um, but I end up getting the same results if you do it this other way. It just takes a few more steps. It's a little more advanced. All right, now I do want to show you one advanced topic here, um, how to do lookup tables with time in both Insight Maker and VinSim. And this also allows me to introduce these things called shadow variables, which help clean up your diagrams a little bit. So let's see how that works. So I'm going to, this is a real simple kind of uh, banking problem here. I want to simulate the growth in a savings account due to interest accumulation. So we've seen this example before. Um, I create a stock savings account. And so if I look um, down in my stock down here, this is the equations for stock. The, I leave the integ alone. That's just the flow rate. I change the initial value to 100. That's what goes in here. Um, I go into my interest flow and that's the one down here. And I'm going to make its formula fixed interest rate times the balance. And then I have a fixed interest rate variable going into that interest. I go into its formula and then I give it this interest rate, which is like an APR, uh, an annual percentage interest rate of 10%, where they take 10%, they divide it by 12 months. And then whatever that interest rate ends up being, that's what gets compounded every month. So they compound every month, but they specify the level a year. It's just the way banks do things. So that's why it's 10% uh, annual percentage rate, APR, 10% divided by 12. So this is how I would simulate this simple reinforced feedback loop. And if I plotted that thing out, um, I would get three lines. Um, I would get my, um, the fixed interest rate, that's the flat blue line. I would get my savings account balance, that's the green line that's growing. And then I would get the interest being accumulated every year and that's the red line that's growing. Okay, nothing new here. This is just a simple fixed um, interest rate. It's kind of like a bacterial growth model. All right, so now I have to think, well, what uh, if my interest rate changes over time? How do I implement a time varying interest rate in Vincent? Well, I can do that with the lookup table, but I need these other things called shadow variables first. So in VinSim, there's this thing called a shadow variable. In the new sketch, um, it's just going to look like this symbol up at the top, where it's got two angle brackets and an S inside it. In old sketch, it actually is the word shadow variable underneath it. But they do the same thing. You, you hit that shadow variable button, and it brings on a list of all of your existing variables plus a few more. And so Shadow variables are just aliases to existing variables. So instead of drawing a line from those variables, you can then create kind of a, a second handle for those variables that allows you to like, if, you had a, if your model was gigantic, so you had some portions of the model here, some portions up here, it might for some reason be really ugly to draw a line all the way across and you don't need to communicate that connection, that remote connection. So instead of drawing a, a link directly across your model, you can create a shadow variable for this variable that's down here, up here. And it's just an alias for that one so that you can create a tiny little line up here without creating that giant line across the whole thing. Now you can also create shadow variables to internal variables in VinSim like the current time. So that's what we're gonna see here. So internal variables like time. So the current time, whether it's year uh, second zero, second one, second two, I can get a handle on that. So the idea here is I can now, um, so if I go back and highlight this, 
if you look closely here, I've created a shadow variable to time, and it shows up with little brackets and kind of gray text, which tells me that that is a variable that um, is coming from somewhere else. That's the shadow variable. In this case, it's coming from inside the simulation. It's the current time. And I'm going to run that in as an input to this variable, variable interest rate. So if I look at the formula for variable interest rate, it has a time as an input. And so I can put that time up here. I'm going to do auxiliary with lookup, just as before. It's going to take as an input for time. And then I can go um, to the graph. And this allows me to change my interest rate over time. So I can go down here and I can say, I want to go from zero to 48 months. So I'm simulating four years. And I can then up here say from zero to around 12 months, I have a certain interest rate. From 12 months to 24 months, I have a different interest rate. From 24 to 36, I have a different interest rate and so on. And so I can draw these and these are kind of stepwise here. So I can, uh, I can make these, um, these nice steps here where I can say year one, year two, year three, year four is interest rate. So I can make the interest rates change over time. Questions about that? So I bring time as an input, and then based on the current time in the simulation, I can look up different interest rates. Okay. So when I do that, if I simulate, then what I've got here is my savings account is this red line, and the interest being generated is the blue line, and the variable interest rate is the green line. So the variable interest rate, it's the blue line and the green line have the same, same shape, even though they have different axes. So the axis specifiers you can see kind of over here, and I even have units down here. Um, and the, But you can see the growth now is a much more kind of interesting growth pattern for the savings rate. It doesn't just explode because it's kind of growing at one rate and then it grows at a different rate, a lower rate, and then it grows at a slightly higher rate and then it basically doesn't grow. And then it starts growing again and then grows a lot faster. And so that's why this red line has this kind of more interesting pattern. Okay, so any questions about that? The variable interest rate example, using time as an input variable. Okay. All right, so it's just sort of a basic tutorial of these things. So let me close then with how to do that exact same thing in Insight Maker. So um, look up tables in Insight Maker, um, make it even easier to make use of time and then other variables as well. So in Insight Maker, if I go up to add primitive, it has this converter. Remember, converter is their name for lookup table. So I add a converter, it has a totally different shape, a totally different look. Um, and so, like they say, converters contain graphical functions or input output tables. So I can go into my newly created converter and I have to um, tell it a couple of things here. I have to tell it the type of interpolation. We'll see what that means. Whether the input source is time, like I just did, or a variable connected to it and, uh, and so on. And the data we can specify as a graph. So I'm just gonna zoom on here. They, by default, it, it chooses time as an input. If I want other variables, I have to connect the variable to it and then select the variable I want as my input source here. So um, if I'm doing this variable interest rate example, I leave the input as time. Um, and then I go under my interpolation, by default, it's linear, which means if I specify the corners of my lookup table, it's gonna create this line kind of like in our first uh, lookup table example where it creates these kind of slanted lines. Now I want the interest rate to hold from point to point. So I'm gonna change the interpolation to none. If I do that, then it creates this step-like pattern. So that I only have to do the leading corners of the steps, not the following corners. So um, that gives me this kind of step-like interest, interest rate here. And so with that, I can get the same sort of output that I got in Vincent. Now, if I wanted to use this lookup table um, with an input source, like maybe I wanted to make the variable interest rate depend upon the current balance, I draw a link from my, the desired input to the lookup table like I would with any other variable in SiteMaker. But then when I click on that lookup table, I go over here and under input source, I have to remember to change it 
from time to this new input, savings account balance. And when I do that, then I can go into my graphical lookup table and I can create um, an interest rate based on my savings account balance. So you could imagine the bank might want to encourage you to put more in your savings account by giving you a graded interest rate. But once you have enough in your savings account, they don't really need you to grow it anymore and then they might drop it down. So really it's better to have a bunch of savings accounts with uh, this amount of money in them than one savings account with this amount of money in them or something like that. So we could simulate this sort of idea of an interest rate that's based on the amount of money that you currently have in the bank. And by doing that, then we can simulate the growth. And so we can see here that we get um, very rapid growth early in this savings account, but then once it hits that critical level where um, the, um, the, the savings rate starts to, to jump down, then I get slower growth in the long run. So I get kind of more interesting patterns of growth in my savings account from this example. All right, I think that's the last basic technical stuff. So those, so, so far they've covered units, sliders, lookup tables, and how to use shadow variables in time. So there is an example, if you want to use shadow variables in Insight Maker, they also have that, it's a simple primitive. I think it's called like phantom variable or something like that. So you can use shadow variables, but you don't have to when you're using time. So any questions about how to use lookup tables or any of these more advanced concepts? Questions online? All right, so um, looking forward, uh, you got spring break coming up. Um, encourage you to start looking at the reading, um, which is going to be due um, exercise uh, during uh, lecture E4. So this is E1. So after spring break, we'll have E2 and E3. Then E4 will be in the week after that. So a lot of time between now and when this reading is due. Um, but your teams, make sure you form those teams. So the Saturday at the end of spring break is when I'm going to be hoping that everybody's got all their teams in. So that anybody who doesn't have their teams in, I can start hassling them or or reassembling teams. So I might have to break, you know, I might have to add a fourth person to three person teams and so on and so forth, just to make sure everybody's got a team. Um, in the unlikely event, hopefully that you decide to, to take a W on the course um, in April when that deadline is, um, let me know ahead of time, just so I don't worry about getting you packaged into a team. So if you know that, so just, just putting that out there. Um, so that's what's kind of due coming up here. Um, and this assignment E2 is released. You have all of the info to start question one now. We'll get the info for question two in the bonus. I think there's a bonus on this one after you come back from spring break. So, um, so let's give an attendance exercise and then I'm happy to open up. There are any final questions here. So as a convenience, I'll put the link in the chat. And the question I have here is, um, what is the construct in VinSim that we use to reference another variable elsewhere in the model? So we have auxiliary variables, stock variables, et cetera. What's the new thing we introduced today? What's it called in VinSim that allows you to um, form an alias to a, a variable that's elsewhere in the model? So I'll put that. And otherwise, have a nice spring break. And so that's all that I've got for you today. So if anybody has questions, be happy to take them. Um, otherwise, the question was, what is the VinSim construct that lets you create an alias to a variable somewhere else in the model? Okay. So there's a good question about the final project proposal. Does everyone have to submit the final project proposal? Everybody has to do the team formation assignment. Once you've done that, I will create groups in Canvas and then the, the proposal will be a group assignment. So whenever one person uploads it, um, it, it counts for everybody. So only one person wants to upload it. But everybody should submit that, um, that team member assignment. 
All right. Have a good week. Yep. Have a good spring break. So if there's any other questions online, happy to take them. Otherwise, I will probably end the meeting momentarily. Actually, yep. oh, go ahead. Had a question. Is it possible to share my screen with you? Because I one of I was trying to add some units in Vensum and I keep getting an error. And I, I'm just wondering if you could help me out. Sure. Um, are you? Um, I can either. In, so if you're willing, I would be happy to keep the recording going in case this would be useful for anyone watching the recording. Otherwise, I'm happy to stop the recording and let you screen share. Um, do you have a preference? Uh, it's fine. You can keep recording. Okay. Great. All right, I, um, I went in and stopped my share. So let me make sure that, yeah, you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Can, can you see? Yeah, I see um, Aaron units for following equation. Okay. Oh yes, yeah. sorry, let me. Uh... All right, so let's see here. So it said, um, so it says for flow of water equals tank gap, flow of water is producing centimeter per second, tank gap is centimeter. Ah, yes. So, um, so the reason this is occurring is, is the, uh, if I were to, I'm gonna use my annotation here. So if we were to look inside your tank gap formula, um, this is probably producing units of centimeters so if um which it should be because the tank gap is in units of centimeters right right yeah so um so what we're missing here is that um is a variable that we never had to worry about before but now is probably good to include so click uh, okay there and we're going to add another so add another variable here um and we can call it like um valve gain or something like that yeah, that's good. And, um, and basically what we need to do is, is tell Vincent how to convert centimeters to centimeters per second. So if you go and, um, and go into valve gain here, we can create uh, a constant there. So go ahead and just, yeah, sorry, edit the formula. And inside here, let's just for now, just put a one for equations. So we're gonna make a, a one-to-one -one mapping, but then under units, up here, um, let's create a, a, a unit there that is going to be um, per second, just one divided by second. And what this is going to mean is that, I'm sorry, not one divided by second. One, uh, I got that. Um, no, that, yeah, that's right. So what this is going to mean is, well, it, technically what I want it to be is, but I'm just simplifying it is um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this gain and we're gonna multiply it by the tank gap. So the tank gap's in centimeters. We multiply this gain and we'll get centimeters per second. And so the so this one is basically gonna is saying for every centimeter of gap, I want a one centimeter per second flow. And so, um, so when you work out the units, this is kind of, it'll end up, I think, working out. So let's hit okay here for that one, for that there, and then draw a, a line in the flow of water. And then you can edit the flow of water formula. And you can just multiply those things together, tank gap times valve gain. Now, if you think about it, tank gap will be in centimeters, valve gain will be in one per second. So when I multiply those things together, they should match the centimeters per second. Uh, okay. So go ahead and do that. Now do your check units and see if it, it's happier with that. All right, let's see here. Um, oh, I think I have, I don't have second and seconds. Um, okay. Let me, settings, uh, equivalence. Oh, good, okay. like that right yep oh and then make sure i think you actually have to 
dope in there. I think you actually have to tell it. I need to add it. Like it's not enough to type. Oh no, we're good. It did it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. so you're good. Okay. Okay. So he, he can um, try the model check now and see if that works any better. Yep. Units are okay. Wow. Okay. Cool. So does that make sense? Yeah, that yeah, that definitely that that helps. And and this actually makes a lot of sense physically because if you're building uh, flow control valves, um, you could imagine make some of them slower and some of them faster. So now if you were to hit synth the sim, for example, it would put a slider by valve gain that would allow you to sort of see how different um, uh, how different toilet valves, you can say yes there. So now if you were to drag that to the right or to the left, then you'll see that the toilet will fill faster and mm -hmm. slower. Yeah. I so, see. and it, it doesn't make much of a difference for this one, but once you start adding things in that have delays and stuff like that, then the speed of the feedback might be the difference between a nice steady rise and a bunch of oscillations. So, so this allows us to kind of explore those things a little more finely. Okay. Yeah, that that definitely makes more sense. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your help. No problem. Any other questions online? I see there's a couple still connected. If not, I'll probably go ahead and end the meeting. All right. Have a great spring break, guys. Looking forward to seeing you back.